Thank you very much. Um, I, I, perhaps I should start with a little story because, because, <laughs> um, in actual fact, I won that one about three years later. They're not just the list I came top, but, um, for the bulletin price. But, uh, I tell you this not just for sheer arrogance, but for the fact that I am afraid I'm a curse. So never give me a prize because, um, John Howard gave me a prize and as soon as he gave me a prize, he lost the election and, <laughs> Julie Bishop gave me a prize. She gave me a Federation Fellowship, and then she got deposed. Um, the bulletin, I tell you, the, now I tell you the bulletin. The bulletin has been publishing for uh, probably a hundred years, and then they gave me this prize. And then they went out of business about six months later. <laughs> so, and they can go on. I, there's a few, so I, it's known as the Waterhouse Curse. So just don't give me a prize if you want to stay employed. That's all I'd say. Okay. Right. Now, um, so you've heard all about, um, or you're going to hear all about lots of physics and lots of nanotechnology. And, and really my thing is molecular biology. And, and I guess I just squeeze in a little bit because, um, as Chris was saying, RNA is my thing, and I'm a firm believer that RNA is like the center of everything, center of life, that DNA is just storage, and that these things that are called messenger RNAs, which supposedly just take the information from the DNA to the, uh, to, to the cytoplasm, sorry, from the chromosomes in the nucleus to the cytoplasm to be translated into proteins and just a message. That is really not what RNA is. I mean, it does that, but it's not, it's only just a little bit of what RNA is about. And in actual fact, you might even think of RNA. So, so DNA is like this linear molecule, right? And it's, it's sort of, it's a helix and, and so on. And it's got digital information. It's just, just the sequence that it is. And, uh, and proteins are, are what's your enzymes and what works. And they're just, they're structural molecules and it's their shape. And in actual fact, RNA is this magic thing. I'm, I'm afraid I'm just going off, off course here. <laughs> but just to tell you that RNA is cool because it's got digital information, but it's analog as well. It's analog. It forms structure just like proteins. So it has both the capacity to transmit digital information and to give and to have an analog function as well. But anyway, I, I digress. I accept to say that RNA is the thing. So hopefully you know about DNA and RNA, and it's the center of, of life, the language of life. And before I go there, I thought I'd just do a slight little preachy thing and just say that I think we as molecular scientists, we, we do, we think of ourselves as, as discoverers. So you're going to hear about people going out into space and, and nanotechnology and physics and stuff and exploring. And, and we feel that we're like astronauts too, except we wear our lab coats, our white lab coats, and we wear these little glasses to stop ourselves being splashed in the face, whereas they wear fancy stuff with flags on their shoulders and so on. But, uh, but we feel that we're exploring as well. And whereas people are looking out into outer space using telescopes and looking at stars and looking at the magical things that are going on there, we in a way almost like turn it around and look down into really what's going on into a cell and we find just as much diversity and amazing things, I think, than, than you can see out in, into space. And so hopefully I'm going to give you a little bit of a flavor of this. So, so back to some theory, and I'm sure you all know this, that if I can get this to work, does this, does this pull? Or if I pull it, will it actually, um, make everything fall apart? Can I have this a bit longer? I'll let you pull it. That's about as long as it goes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right, oh, right. it's gonna be, uh, Yes, I can just about manage. Yeah. So, so as you, I'm sure you all know that if you're, it's a plant or a human or a whatever, a, 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 a higher organism, that it's going to have, it's going to be made up of these cells. And cells are going to have a nucleus, and inside that nucleus are your chromosomes, and that chromosome is made up of DNA. And it's double-stranded DNA. So, and each bit of DNA is made up of these four Basis for nucleotides, A's, G's, C's, and T's, and that they match each other. So a T will, will, will stick together with an A and a C with a G. So, uh, you get this double helix that these guys are holding on to these guys. And these are important things that you've got, that I have to sort of tell you in order to, to explain what we've, what we've done. I'm sure you guys know all about this already. Uh, 
<laughs> okay. So, but that's DNA, double-stranded DNA. And the thing about DNA is that it's in the chromosomes and it's double-stranded. And so this sequence of a gene is made up of, of DNA, which is double-stranded, two strands. So if we actually go backwards, so that's these two strands here. And we often just talk about one see one strand of the sequence, but you, it's important to know that they're double-stranded and that they can be complementary. Because if we look at RNA, it's messenger RNA. It is actually made from the coding region of a gene. So the gene is just a, it's just a bit of DNA sequence, and we can divide it up into three regions. We can divide it up into what's the promoter region, and that's the sort of sequence that's going to drag these enzymes that are going to come along here and make a copy of this coding region sequence. Except that's DNA, and they're going to make a copy which is going to be RNA, and it's going to be single-stranded, and it'll be complementary to one of these strands of DNA, but it's RNA, and that's the thing that moves out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm to be translated into proteins. Okay, so that's just the central dogma. Double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, and the RNA gets translated into proteins. And uh, what I'm going to tell you about is how we silence genes, because it's really a really cool thing to be able to kill off genes. Sometimes there's a, you want a gene to be switched off in a certain place or a certain time, or it's a gene that's gone out of control and you just want to silence it. So not only do you want to sometimes put in new genes, but often you want to turn off genes. And that this technology that I'm going to tell you about, stuff that sort of came out, we, we found about by accident, whoops, found about by accident, uh, is all about how to switch off genes. Okay. So, and what we're going to do is tell you how it works is by, by actually degrading this messenger RNA. So that normally, as the, whoops, as the DNA goes translated, transcribed into RNA, the RNA into protein, if you can destroy this messenger molecule, you can stop this protein being made because the instructions are coded for here, copied into this, and then interpreted, read into a protein sequence in the cytoplasm. So if we can stop this messenger, we can stop the production of this protein. Okay. And so I'm going to now, I wonder if I can turn the lights down a bit. Is this possible? I was going to show you rather than, um, describe this process, I was just going to let this movie do the, the whole thing for us. Okay. Are we ready? That should, I'm sure that should do it. Okay. So I'm going to steal a bit of YouTube, complete with American accents and with computer anima animation, we can enter the cell to view this remarkable system at work. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, the process of translation begins.
Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. Okay, so that's the end of that one, if I can get out of this. Just press the screw. Okay, so hopefully all I wanted you to see from that was how this DNA that's in the in the Nucleus is made into a messenger RNA that goes out into the site, out of the nucleus, through the nuclear pore, and translated into the protein. And so what we're going to be doing is actually destroying that messenger that moves from the nucleus into the, into the cytoplasm. Okay. So, but in order to do this, uh, I need to teach you some, uh, some basics of being a genetic engineer, how you make a transgene. And so, this is transgene 101, and supposing you wanted to make a transgene, it's really not as difficult as you might imagine that, that, um, suppose we want to make a, a, a Drosophila, a fruit fly that glows in the dark, that glows nice, pretty, um, fluorescent green, say. We've got these fruit flies, right. and we've got these jellyfish, and the jellyfish, they naturally produce a, a rather beautiful fluorescent protein, which we often call uh, GFP, it's a green fluorescent protein. So if we wanted to actually make this, this fruit fly glow in the dark, what we would need is we need the the gene, the promoter elements and the terminator elements from the insect gene, and we need the coding region that codes for the protein that will glow in the dark. And so what we do is we use some enzymes called restriction enzymes, and we get the DNA and we cut it up uh, using these molecular scissors into little blocks. So we take the promoter region, which is the one that tells the, 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 the DNA to start this piece of this sequence for the polymerase to come along and to make a copy in RNA of the coding region. And then the terminator is where it just tells the uh, the polymerase to stop. So it's just like a start and a stop, and then the stuff that you stick in the middle is the bit that codes for the protein of your gene. So what we do is we cut them up, throw away all the bits that we don't need, and so we've just got a promoter sequence, a coding region sequence, and a terminator sequence. And we add a bit of glue, it's an actual called DNA ligase, which will actually stick those bits together. So we now have made a gene that's basically the promoter sequence, a bit of DNA, coding region sequence, which is a bit of DNA, and the terminator sequence, which is a bit of a DNA. So you just got this string. And that's basically all there is to it, is to make your uh, transgene. The only thing you've got to do is you've got to be able to stick it into the, the organism that you want. So here's our, um, uh, jelly, uh, uh, normal fruit fly. And this, with now you put this new gene in. Now if we turn the lights off and shine a blue light on it, we'll get a fruit fly that will glow of this beautiful green. So simply by just taking that sequence, you've popped it into the, into the chromosomes of this, this fly, and it now will, uh, glow this beautiful blue, a uh, beautiful green. I should say, I said, blue, and so you can use green, there's fluorescent blue, there's fluorescent red, and so on. So you can choose, you can make almost color-coded fruit flies if you want to. And you can do this almost for anything you like. So here's some bacteria where we've just literally taken, um, I told you that you can get not only the green fluorescent protein from jellyfish, but there's a beautiful uh, red from coral, 
from the Great Barrier Reef. And, and here is two bacteria solutions. This is a one with the, the fluorescent green, and this is one with the fluorescent red. And you can, um, you can make goldfish that you can buy in the United States. You can go to a pet shop now and buy your own green fluorescent goldfish. So turn the lights off, shine a blue light, and it goes from gold to, to, to green. I don't know why you, exactly why you want one like that, but we find this, this is a really cool reporter because in the olden days when we were looking at, at gene expression and so on, you'd have to do, you'd have to sort of like kill the cells and treat them in a certain way to actually see a gene expression. But now that we have these fluorescent proteins, we can see things in, in real life. So you can see a gene turning on. You don't do anything except shine the light at it and you can then see a gene being expressed or switched off or moving and so on. So, and, and so that's the fish. And here is a plant. So this is one from my lab. And you might say that's not very exciting. It's a plant. They always look green. But this is in the dark with a blue light. In fact, uh, um, they would actually look a bit look red. The chlorophyll looks red under this blue light that, that excites the green. OK. So but how do you get this in, into your, your plant? Uh, or, or, so into a bacteria, it's dead easy. You just literally get your bit of DNA and you have your bacteria and you put it into a, into a, a vessel. It's a little cuvette type thing. And then zap it just like a Frankenstein thing. You put an electric current and, and the sort of holes open up in the pores of the, in, in the walls of the bacteria and in gets the DNA and then the bacteria just replicates it. So that's dead easy to put it into a bacteria. Into a plant, it's also dead easy. Putting it into a human is much more, more tricky and, and ethically questionable. But, um, <laughs> but into a plant, people don't seem to care quite so much. If you've got to eat it, then people care a bit more. But, but f luckily for the sort of stuff I do, I'm trying to find out about mechanisms more than, than uh, making GMO food products, which is, I guess, uh, has its own questions. Okay, but how do you put the DNA in your gene into, into, into a plant? So, well, in fact, there's this bacteria that really makes it easy for us. There's a bacteria called Agrobacterium, and in bacteria, there are <coughs> the DNA is in two forms. You have this DNA that's sort of the chromosome, which is a whole bunch of DNA coding for all the genes that the bacteria requires. But it has these things called plasmids, which are little circular bits of DNA, and they get replicated up to high levels in a bacterium. And as I say, the way to put new plasmids into a bacteria is you just put it in a, in a, in a test tube and apply a current and whoosh, it goes in. So that bit's easy, but the amazing thing is this agrobacterium, which you, uh, which tomato growers won't like very much, but just about everybody else, uh, all the molecular biologists like this, because this um, uh, bacterium it actually infects tomatoes and causes this thing called a crown gall, which is this ugly looking thing here, and it's caused by these bacteria. But it's actually very clever because What's happening is this bacteria really likes its own sugars. It doesn't like the normal sugars a plant makes. And so what it does is it transfers a few genes into the chromosomes of the, the plant cell to make it make the nice sweet sugars that the bacteria likes to live on. It also makes um, some hormones so that the, that the cells divide and make this rather nasty gall. But the clever thing about it is, is that in this plasmid here, there's a region called the right border and a region here called the left border. And so here are your three genes that the bacteria normally produces to make its gall and to make the sugars and stuff. But these are completely dispensable. You can throw those away. And as long as you've just got this little sequence here at the right border and this here at the left border, you can put whatever piece of DNA you like in there and the back, put it into the bacteria and the bacteria will transfer that into the cell of the plant. So what we do is we have our nice new transgene, suppose it's our GFP gene, and we put in a herbicide resistance gene. And so you put that into the, into the bacteria and infect the plant. And so what the things that get transferred are just this, is this piece of sequence from, from, <laughs> if I can get the mouse to do it, <laughs> from here through to, <laughs> ah. I'm sure you get the message. It's from, from, from here through to here. Um, and it will be transferred. So what you then do is, so you take some pieces of the leaf 
and you grow it on these petri dish of media and you put the right hormones in so these cells will divide up into a into a lump of cells then you add the right hormones again and they will regenerate into whole plants but the trick is that when you're doing this regeneration from um from lumps of of, of leaf callus that you also put the herbicide into the media so that only those cells that have got the new DNA, they've got the, so you've got your, say, your fluorescent protein gene and you've got your herbicide resistance gene. The herbicide is going to kill off all those cells that haven't got the new bit of DNA, but the bits that get the new bit of DNA have this enzyme that breaks down the herbicide. So they live, they divide, and they make the whole new plant. And so you've got a whole new plant made from basically one cell which had this new gene, and so it's now got that gene, and it will pass it on, and it will be inherited in the seed and, and forevermore. So that's the way in which we do this, and that's the sort of the basic bit I wanted to, to get across to you, uh, so that the rest makes of what I'm going to tell you makes sense. But I'd like to switch gears a bit now, and I'll ask you if you recognise uh, this this handsome man here. Have we got any clues who this guy is? And I'll tell you, it's got nothing to do with plants. MacArthur, not MacArthur. He's got nothing to do with plants. Okay. A handsome man. Okay. If I show you that picture of him, perhaps... Edward Jenner, that's right, absolutely. And, and what's he doing in this picture? What is he doing now in this picture? He's... In smallpox, absolutely. And so we, we touched, we skirted a little bit about ethics. I thought I might just read to you this little bit of description of, of what he did in 1796 and uh, whether your medical uh, boards would allow you to do this today. So he took this poor eight-year-old guy off the street and gave him, and first of all, he inoculated him with cowpox. And then a while later, he injected him with smallpox. And then the experiment was a great success, as you know, because he lived. So I don't think you'd quite be able to do that today. Um, uh, I guess if he lived, it's all right. If he died, you'd probably be in, you know, you'd be in jail. But so you know about vaccination. You know about when you put a small... Uh, sorry, a mild virus into a, into a human, like smallpox, like, sorry, cowpox. And then you're challenged with a severe virus like smallpox, that this gives you protection. But did you know that, that this can happen in a plant too? That I can tell you that there is no immune system, there are no antibodies, but in fact, these poor little green things that you eat and you don't give too much attention to, they have, they too have a, a fabulous defense mechanism, very much like an immune system. And in fact, that's what we stumbled over about, well, about 15 years ago is when we first started to begin to, to realize that there was something going on, uh, or, 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 or rather ideas of, of the mechanism. But, uh, and I'll, as this will hopefully come clear later, in fact, the first signs of this were, were back, this guy saw this in 1928. Can you see how this plant here is infected with a virus down here, but it gets to a certain point, and then the plant grows completely in a healthy way from then on. So what happens is if you have your plant, and you and it's, this is a nice uh, healthy leaf, and you, challenge, you can challenge them with a, a mild virus, a virus that just gives just a little bit of symptom, not very much, just a little, goes a little bit yellower, or you can hit it with a severe strain. And these are the similar viruses, uh, like cousins as it were, but one causes mild symptoms and one causes severe. So a bit like, uh, cowpox and smallpox. So here's the, uh, the smallpox version that you hit this poor little plant with, uh, with your necrotic virus and the virus will kill that plant. But you can challenge him with a mild virus, and so he gives just a little slight yellowing. And you can even take this, once he's been infected with this mild virus, and graft him onto a, a plant. And maybe you can see that graft junction here. So this bit, from here to here, has been a bit of a plant that's got this mild virus. And it's grafted first actually onto a healthy plant. And then inoc inoculate that healthy plant with this killer. And it starts killing off this plant here, and you can see the necrosis down this. And after a short while, those leaves will go black and die. But this 
top part will grow in a healthy way for, for, uh, and set seed and so on. So that something is going on. Somehow this plant here has got protection against this virus that's coming up here. And it's this protection that, um, that we discovered the mechanism a, a while ago. And so I thought I'd just describe to you how, uh, how we stumbled across this. So plant viruses, you, you know that we get viruses. You probably didn't know that plants get viruses, but they cause billions of dollars of damage to, the, to your crops every year. They, um, some viruses reduce the, the wheat yield by know, about 5% globally, so that's billions of dollars are just lost due to this uh, particular, one particular virus called barley yellow dwarf virus. Uh, and... Um, but there's a whole spectrum of viruses, that, and they're just like animal viruses, but they infect plants. But what I wanted to tell you is that, that they have a, a, a basic structure. They have the, the plant virus is just normally one um, piece of RNA, about 6,000 nucleotides, 6,000 of these letters long. And they code for basically three uh, genes the replicase gene that replicates it, a movement gene which helps this, the, uh, the RNA move from cell to cell, and the coat protein gene that wraps this RNA up into a particle. And so it was knowing this that we thought we were going to use this information to, um, to protect plants against viruses. And so as I said, this was a long time ago now, it seems like a long time ago. And there's this, this cool guy called Roger Beachy in the United States, and what he did is he said, ha, huh, he's going to protect a plant against a virus. And this idea is that you have this RNA and you wrap it up in this coat protein. That's how a virus particle works. And so what he would do is he'd take that coat protein gene, the gene from the virus, it's RNA, so he turns it into DNA, then he puts the promoter on the end, a terminator, and he puts it in the plant. And so this plant is not infected with a virus, it's, but it's just got a gene that makes lots of this coat protein subunit, and they normally assemble together to make a nice particle. And so he thought, if I make this plant produce lots of this subunit, then I challenge the plant with a virus, it's going to be a bit like a bit like sex, really, that here's this guy, this RNA, it's got to come in, and it's going to try and replicate. And before he can do that, he comes in as a virus particle, and he has to take his clothes off. He's got to take all this, this uh, coprotein off. But in the cell, there's all these subunits of coprotein being made, and so as soon as he takes his clothes off and he's ready, vroom, this coprotein is going to wrap it all up again. He'll take it off and zoom, and, and this would keep on going. And so this poor frustrated RNA molecule would just be just, just packaged. So it's a nice sort of story and a nice idea. And, and the truth is that it actually worked in Roger's case. With Roger's virus, he did this and it worked. And, and then, He's doing this and say, so around the world, all the we plant virologists went, wow, this is cool. We can just do this. We have a favorite plant, a favorite crop, favorite virus we want to protect it against. All we've got to do is take the coprotein gene, whack it in there, and we won't have any virus problems in our crops anymore. So that was cool. So he did that, and he, Roger did this, and it worked for him. But everybody else, we tried this, and, and it, it would work occasionally, ever, just, just now and then, but most of the time it wouldn't work. And it would seem, if we measured for the protein that was being made from the virus coat protein, that the plants that were producing lots of it seemed to be highly susceptible to the virus, and the ones that were producing virtually none were the ones that actually seemed to be protected. So we could get a protection, but only rarely, and it, and it also gave the wrong thing. It was the ones which weren't producing this coat protein. And similarly, uh, oh, so this is just a demonstration of one. So here's a here's this potato, and we've whacked in a a, a um, the coat protein gene, and here it is. It's protected, challenged with the virus, and so you get this this really nice protection. But this would be, as I say, only very occasionally, only just one particular plant out of say twenty, and and you never could predict when it was. And similarly, you could put that gene in backwards, and it would also work about one in twenty. So it's in backwards, it's not going to code for the protein. It's as if you're trying to read the book from the back end to the front end. It's just sort of nonsense in a way, but it would still work. So the question was, how? what's happening in these very rare occurrences 
where we get protection. So what we did is we, 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 we looked at those rare plants that gave us protection and the, and the plants that didn't give any protection and said, what's the difference? And the deal is, so this is actually a, a gel, which is a, sort of a, like a, a jelly that we run the DNA through and then we can probe for. And so each band here represents a copy of the gene that we put in. And so when we found the ones that were giving protection, they actually had multiple copies. So we tried to put in just one gene, but it had gone in many times. So in this case, it had gone in one, two, three, four, five times. In this case, one, two, three, four, and so on. Whereas the ones that were protected it's like this guy here has only got one copy. So what's the difference between why is this one, uh, sorry, this is, sorry, these are the protected, the multiple ones are protected and the single copies are not protected, I should say. So what's the difference between that? Why should having more copies be, be better than having just one or two? And the answer was that when we looked at it, that you could get multiple copies and no protection. The trick to doing it was when you got these genes going in in what we call an, in, in an inverted repeat. So you've got one gene that's gone into the DNA code going in that direction and one going in the opposite direction. So these, these guys here, you see the promoter is driving it in this direction to make RNA in this direction. And whereas this copy of the gene is in the opposite one and driving it in this way. So we were saying, well, okay, so this is the trick. So what's so special about that? Is it just that there's one copy here, doesn't work, and three copies here? No, it's not just a numbers thing. It's the arrangement of these genes. And then we did this experiment, which was, um, oops, if I go backwards, which was, if we took a plant which just had one copy of the gene, but this is in the, this is what we call in the forward sense, you know, so this is the, like the coprotein, which would code for the coprotein, properly, and I told you that we could occasionally get antisense, ones that were, we made, that you put the gene in backwards, we put the coding region in backwards, and that would occasionally give you protection. So what we did is we took a plant that had just one copy in the forward direction, but it was still susceptible to the virus, and one plant that had this in the backwards direction, but was susceptible to the virus. And then we crossed the two together. So we have this plant here, producing a, what we call a sense messenger RNA, and we had this plant here producing an antisense. And they're both susceptible. And when you cross them, a quarter of them will inherit just this sense gene. And a quarter of them will inherit just this antisense gene. A quarter of them will inherit neither gene. But then this was the trick. This was our hallelujah moment, was that a quarter will inherit both the sense and the antisense gene. And all of these plants were completely immune to the virus. So they would do this cross, and if we did it 20 plants, then we'd find that five out of those 20 would be totally protected. And when we looked at them, they're the ones that had both the sense and the antisense gene. And so the answer we finally worked out was this, that you have your, your inner cell, you have your double-stranded DNA in the nucleus, and you have in their messenger RNA in single strand. But viruses are different. They bring in their, their viral RNA, single stranded, and they bring in with it their own replicase, or like polymerase, which makes a complementary copy of that RNA. And so this is completely unique to, uh, uh, within a cell. A cell does not normally have double stranded RNA, only if it's infected with a virus. And so we've discovered that, in fact, that all eukaryotic cells, you, plants, or everything that's sort of a multicellular organism has this mechanism that can sense double-stranded RNA and say it's it's foreign and, and destroy it. So we've said there's a mechanism there, it recognizes this as double-stranded, and then it can somehow use this sequence to destroy even the single-stranded version of it. But the trigger is this double strand. And so when we had this you know, this, these multiple copies, what we were actually doing was we were actually making double-stranded RNA by accident. So we've made one by crossing almost by design, and this one has happened by accident. And so the grand mechanism that is doing, that, that you have, that plants have and everything has, is that if you put in double-stranded RNA, there's an enzyme called a DICER that will chop it up into little bits, 
and then it will load one of these little bits, it'll separate it out and load it into this enzyme called an argonaut. And it will use that one strand as a guide to look for single-stranded messenger RNA that it matches, and then it'll cut it. So I've drawn a, a, a little cartoon of this. So here we go again. So here's your cell, and here's your nucleus, and here are these dices. They're just sitting around, and there's, n there's lots of messenger RNA, and it's just ignoring this. But if you bring in a virus that's replicating, that's double-stranded RNA, then these dices will spring into action and recognize those. And they, and, and say, this is what I, this is my food. I'll chop it up into these little pieces. And if we just focus on one of those, it'll actually, it actually chops it up to 21. I just couldn't be bothered to draw, draw 21 for everything. I've just drawn it as five, but it looks like that. So they chop it up into these 21 pieces, 21 bit pieces, and then it will leave just one strand in this argonaut. So now you have, this is your argonaut with just one strand of 21 bases. And so any, now it scans all the single-stranded RNA in the cell till it finds one that it matches. And when it, when it sees the right sequence, it chops it up. And so this is what's going on inside you and inside plants all the time. If you listen very carefully, you might hear it. I don't know. <laughs> but, so this is this mechanism that we suddenly stumbled over, that double-stranded RNA is this key to the turning on this degradation mechanism. And that because it's this specificity of 12, of 21 bases, it's like a fingerprint. It can go and look for just the right piece of RNA, because 21 is a magic number. It allows you, so by chance of you hitting the wrong thing with 21 matches, is about 1 in 10 to the 13. So the chances of it by accident are very, very small. So, so nature has actually worked out in a way, what is the, I don't need to have 50, I don't need, and 10 is not enough, 21 is your magic number, which incidentally is half the value of 42, which I'm sure you all know is a very important number. Okay, so... Um, now, I've shown you how to make a transgene and how to make a GFP of green fluorescent protein um, drosophila here. So how do we make double-stranded RNA? What we can do is we can say, well, we've now worked out that there's this viral defense mechanism, but we, and that's nice, we can make plants defended, but we would really like to kill off lots of different genes to, to be able to regulate them and silence them. So can we use this basic mechanism that's already, nature is already stuck inside every uh, developed cell? We can, can we, can we use it? And the answer, of course, I wouldn't be telling you this if we couldn't. So th yes, we can. And what we do is we use a hairpin. And so what we have is, this is the same thing I told you before, promoter. And then that's, this would be the coding region that would code for the amino acids of your protein and terminator. But we don't care because we're talking RNA now. We're not talking proteins. This is the region that is transcribed into RNA. So supposing that's the gene that we want to kill off and it's the DNA sequence along here. All we do is we say we take the front end of this gene, this sequence, and we duplicate it turn it around and stick it on the back end so that when it's transcribed, the RNA is going to be produced on, along here, along here, and then keep on going. And then if, if we stuck that, there's a terminator at the end and it'll stop. So this region is actually going to be complementary to this region because we've turned it around. And so that when we make this, this RNA molecule, it will, instead of being... Uh, uh, just a linear thing. It will go along here, then it'll fold around a loop, and then it will stick onto that sequence because it's the complement, and it will zip up with, uh, with well, I should say that RNA is a U rather than a T, so A to U's and G's to C's, A to U's, G's to C's, all the way. And so this molecule will just zip up as like a helix of, of RNA and a loop at the end. And so this helix, this stem that we have here, is, just looks like double-stranded RNA. It is double-stranded RNA, apart from the fact that it, if you cut it there, you'd say it's two strands sticking together. So this is the trick. So this is how we can make double-stranded RNA in a cell. We just make an RNA that folds back and, and, and sticks with itself. So will this work now? So what could, Because the deal is, in a way, we can say this will target degradation. So let's just suppose 
And that's for viruses. Suppose we want to kill off the, the gene that makes this brown seed color in this plant. What we do is we take the gene that we know, we take the sequence of it's a Schalkone synthase gene, it doesn't really matter what it's called, but we take that RNA that's from the gene and we make a, a hairpin against that structure, against that sequence. And so when we do that and put that back in the plant, we now get these plants that produce yellow seed instead of brown seed, because the gene that makes the brownness of the seed is completely silenced. So in one way, what we've done is we've just persuaded the, that, that plant that that yellow gene was a virus, that basically it, it's because it's seen a region of that double-stranded RNA that's triggered it, and then it can use those pieces to go and find the messenger RNA of that gene and kill it off. So that's, that's basically the technology. And now you can, so you can use it in anything you like. You can make virus resistance. So this is this barley yellow dwarf. Costs billions of dollars a year in your wheat, barley, uh, rice crops. Uh, that's it infected and that's it challenged with the same virus, but now protected. Here you can change it flowering time. These plants are the same age, but there's a protein that stops plants from flowering. So, uh, to hold them back. So if you want to change the flowering, you can just silence that and the plants now flower early. Well, pharmaceuticals, I'll come on to that in a minute. Uh, you can change the, uh, the drugs that it makes. Uh, there's a company that started off in, in Melbourne that you may or may not know called the Blue Rose. And the trouble that they had was when they were trying to make a rose that was blue, they, could, they, they had to use a pink rose to have the right components to make it blue, but it still kept on looking more like purple than blue. But you can now use this mechanism to silence the red gene to make it an even bluer blue, or making healthy oils and so on. So I just thought I'd give you a couple of examples of, of this. Um, in in cotton, you, I'm sure you know cotton crop, and you know that it's the uh, the fiber that you make, but you probably didn't know that that in fact you make cotton oil from crushing the seeds. So you not only get the fiber, but in here are these seeds and you crush that oil. And uh, in fact, if you're going to have fish and chips, chances are that it's cooked in, in cotton oil. That's a high probability. So, but the trouble with oils, as you probably know, with fats, is that some fats are good for you and some fats are bad for you. And that Saturated fats are really bad for you. They raise your LDL, your, your cholesterol levels. And whereas some fats the, are, are really are quite good for you and they lower your LDL cholesterol levels. But they are really heat unstable. So what you really want is you want an oil that is actually uh, stable at high temperatures so you can cook with, but it's also that lowers your, your cholesterol level or even, um, uh, even if it's just neutral, just doesn't raise it. And so the thing with cotton oil is that you, you've got, you've grown your cotton crop and you've got your fibers and you've got this seed which is almost doing nothing, but you can crush it and make oil. So wouldn't it be nice if you could actually make these, this seed that gave you a really a good oil that was healthy for you and you could deep fry your, your fish and chips in it. So what you really want is you want an oil that is in the middle here that makes these monounsaturated fatty acids so that they are stable enough to cook with but they also lower your cholesterol level. And if you look at cotton oil, the trouble is, is that it's, it's unhealthy. It's towards these palmitic end. This is the ones that get, raises your LDL. And this, whereas this pathway here of your fatty acids, when it gets to here, it's good for, it lowers your cholesterol level, but it's unstable. So what we really want to do is we want to stop it here. We want to have higher lactic acid. We want to stop this conversion. So all we need to do is to identify the gene that does that conversion, which is actually the delta-12 desaturase, and make a hairpin against it. And so here we're done. So we're stopping that conversion from a leg to linear leg. This is the normal profile uh, of cotton oil. What we really want is we want a high level of this. So if we take the cotton plant, put in our hairpin against, hairpin gene against this gene, and then we see what we've got. And this is the answer to what we get. We've now got cotton that produces cotton oil that is 75% oleic acid. And so by this, just this one example of killing off the right gene, you can make a product that hopefully 
uh, people will like, that they will have high, uh, it'll be healthy oils that you can fry with. Okay, commercial oil things. And so, um, I thought I'd finish with a, slight, a slightly different one, um, and that is uh, legal drugs. So, if you, in the poppies, you probably know that Australians, uh, Tasmania grows um, uh, poppies legally. It's the largest legal drug maker in the world, Tasmania. But they have um, 20,000 hectares of um, uh, opium poppies. And, and it's highly, so it's highly regulated. You know, if you go there and you, you actually stop by an opium uh, poppy field, then, and start looking over the fence, you'll find helicopters will come flying over and people will come charging along in jeeps and ask you, what are you doing? Because, as you know, it's a very valuable crop, but, uh, and, and it's tightly regulated that there's only 20,000 hectares. That's it. That's all that you're allowed to do. So if you can just bump up the product, the, the, the efficiency of your opium poppy by 5%, you, you can still grow the stuff, 20,000 acres, but you get 5% more. You get of a very, also of already a very valuable drug. So. Here we go. We, hairpins are your answer. So this is just to show you that uh, this is where how they grow the opium poppies in, in Tasmania. It looks very nice. Uh, they often grow potatoes. So you can choose potatoes or opium poppies. And, <laughs> and certain very wealthy farmers who seem to drive Mercedes and uh, very nice cars, um, whereas the potato farmers seem to grow, seem to drive burnt out old trucks. But, so there's, there's an, difference there. But anyway, so what they do is they grow the opium poppies and then they harvest them just like a combine harvester, crush them and get their, um, and get their, uh, uh, get their drugs out of them. But what you really want is you want codeine and morphine. These are the, th- these are the drugs you want. This is the metabolic pathway. You, you, you may or not have not known this, but uh, tyrosine, you know, you're just your normal amino acid is the main, is the thing that you're going to get your, your codeine and morphine from. It comes from, from, from this basic starter. And it goes through these different enzyme steps and it's taking you plonk to plonk to plonk to plonk down to morphine. So you want codeine and morphine. And you really don't want your profits going down here and into, I can't even pronounce it, sanguine, marine, whatever that is, or into noscopine or pavarine, or into orpavine. You really want it to go straight down into morphine. And so what you can do is you can use these hairpins again to just to prune this tree, to prune this pathway. So if you stop this and stop this, then it directs it straight the way down. And I guess, again, I wouldn't be telling you this uh, if it didn't work. So that you can, and now it produces 20% more uh, morphine and codeine. Uh, and uh, if they can get the regulatory authority to, to, uh, to do this, then they'll make 20 to 30% more profit. Okay, so that's just a couple of examples of, of, of hairpins and, and sort of how it works. And I thought on Wednesday we'll... We'll have some hands-on stuff and we'll start injecting some plants with stuff and we'll see some of the cool things that the small RNAs can do. And so this, in a way, was your, your basic introduction to the, to the, to the technology and to the background. Uh, I would just like to leave you with, 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 um, another mention of these small RNAs. So I told you about, uh, if you put double-stranded RNA into a into a plant, it gets chopped up into these twenty ones, and then they will uh, kill off the, your gene. Um, what you can do in, in, in humans, and there are lots of trials about this, is to get these twenty-one small RNAs, and you can use them as a drug themselves. So instead of making long double-stranded RNA and sticking it in as a gene or something, you can. People are now in the medical. Areas are using this as a, as a, as a, actually as a drug. So you're putting in the small RNAs themselves. And so they're being used or tested for therapies for, for all kinds of everything. For, for silencing genes in cancers, for, uh, a lot of protecting against viruses, but diabetes, cholesterol, obesity, virtually whatever, uh, almost whatever disease or thing that you want to change. These small RNAs, just these tiny little 21 base uh, RNAs, are now being used uh, as a as a drug. I mean, I guess um, I don't think there's any out 
In cl- I mean, there's lots in clinical trials. I don't know that any have been approved yet for for general release, but there's a, a mass of, of people trying these. And we use these small RNAs and this RNA silencing uh, in the research community throughout the world for silencing genes. And so I think that is uh, the end, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.